instant in prayer, St. Paul says in today's epistle. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. But did you notice how the Mass began? I mean, at the introit. Let all the earth adore thee, and sing a psalm to thy name. Say, recite a psalm to thy name, O Most High. Last night, there was a beautiful scene which awaited me as I arrived here at the seminary, here in church. The choir stalls were filled with seminarians, aspirants to holy orders, clerics, priests, solemnly, sonorously singing in the old Latin, the last of the seven daily services we call the divine office, compline. That means the completion, the church's beautiful prayer for a quiet night and a perfect end. Save us, O Lord, as we keep watch. Keep us as we sleep, that we may keep watch with Christ and rest in peace. But I am convinced that had I been able to visit last night many a Catholic home, some of your families, perhaps, I would have witnessed the consoling scene of united prayer as well, the father and the mother and the children and the family rosary. Do these prayers, chanted with the ancient texts and ceremonies here in church, and the other, the simple daily prayer of Hail Marys and Our Fathers marked off for meditation in decades. Do they have anything in common? They are both of them prayer. That is to say, an excellent example of that constant or instant prayer St. Paul exhorts us to today. The lifting up of the heart and the mind to God. How? In acts of adoration, as the introit says, to acknowledge God's excellence. And then thanksgiving for his own glory and his goodness and the many benefits he bestows upon man. And then reparation or atonement for the monstrous ingratitude of our sins. Our very indifference to his goodness. Our sins and the sins of others. And Yet still, confidently, like children, round about dinner time, we instinctively turn to the Father with petition to ask our Lord for all we need, as he knows best. The public and official prayer of the church is called the sacred liturgy. The sacraments, the sacramentals, the holy mass, but above all, that pearl of great price, which is set by the church, the mass, amongst other jewels, the daily prayer of the divine office, which is recited night and day by clerics and major orders, and sometimes still today by religious. Thanks be to God. The essence of this prayer is the Psalter, that's what the introit is talking about, the 150 Psalms of David from the Old Testament, which in the New served as the prayer book for Jesus and for Mary. In these Psalms, it is our Lord himself who is praying. These powerful prayers of the monks of old for how many centuries? of priests and religious, have always been piously envied by the faithful because in them they saw the standard, the ideal of prayer. And very early on it became customary for those who did not possess the learning or the Latin to manage them themselves or the books. If you wanted a book of the Psalms, that would be about the cost of a good cow, and for the whole of the Bible, 
why that would be the value of your farm, hand copied as they were on vellum. And after all, most were engaged as today in the normal duties of your state of life, work and family. But still that desire to pray, to pray with those who are, you might say, professional prayers, using what? what? What Our Lady called the foundation stone, the Our Father. Tertullian says it's the summary of the whole New Testament. And then counting their prayers off in groups of 50. At the beginning, some monks or hermits used pebbles, and then later on, beads. 150 for the Psalms of King David. That became known as the bravery of the Christian life or bravery of the gospel. And very early on too, after each Our Father, they said the beginning of our Hail Mary, which is known as the angelic salutation. And they prayed as you do today, the beads. Bead is just an Anglo-Saxon word meaning a prayer. Meditating on the mysteries of the gospel of the incarnation, the passion, and the resurrection, as we say at the end of our rosary and that collect, and then all of the surrounding events of these mysteries. I think there is a beautiful unity between the layman's psalter, as it was called, and the great original prayer, which is the divine office. You are blessed here at the seminary chapel to have the office chanted solemnly, sometimes each day. The Vespers is the greatest of the hours, and sometimes for Christmas or for Holy Week there will be the Matins sung as well. I'm here to preach the annual retreat. Now this year, the theme is the divine office or the bravery, which becomes the duty of our seminarians at subdiaconate, and is the duty of the priest his whole life long. And I ask you, as I always do, kindly to remember the retreatants in your prayers, and that would mean the rosary, your angelic psalter. How, if you have a moment, let me tell you, the answer to the question, how did it get the rosary, its final form? In the gospel today, Our Lady is at the wedding feast, and that symbolizes the church here on earth, the wedding feast, and she sees a need, and she, serene, the queen, provides for it. And she just says to the waiters, that would be you and me, do whatever my son tells you. How did the institution of the rosary come about? You know, you remember that story. I mean, the devastation in the 12th, 13th centuries of a whole region in southern France with the Albigensian heresy, the original anti-life heresy, apostasy more like it, similar to Protestantism, in many ways, the idea was we just accept Jesus Christ and reject the Catholic Church and you will be fine. There are no commandments, no masses, offices, or ceremonies, and they did offer a kind of a baptism in the spirit called the consolamentum. Saint Dominic, appalled when he passed through the region, at the anarchy, the utter immorality which this heresy occasioned in all these regions around Toulouse in southern France, joined himself to other preachers, but they were not successful. Possibly, they say, because according to the custom of the day, the preachers wore fine silks and, and rode in to preach on caprizant horses with soldiers. In any case, St. Dominic at some point, Blessed Alan tells us this, was desperate and downhearted at the enormity of the destruction, the power of this heresy. So he goes to the forest near Toulouse, and there he spends alone three days and three nights in prayer and fasting in the most extreme penance, scourging himself unto blood. Our Lady appeared to him and explained 
that intellectual preaching would not be enough to convert the heretics. They needed a higher and illuminating grace bestowed by the Holy Ghost. And how do you think they would get it? Well, Our Lady asked St. Dominic, she said, Dominic, do you know which weapon the Holy Trinity wants to use to reform the world? And Dominic humbly and correctly demurred, the Mother of God would know better the answer to that question than he. I want you to know, Our Lady responded, that the battering ram in this kind of warfare has always been the angelic Psalter, which is the foundation stone of the New Testament. Therefore, if you want to reach these hardened hearts and win them over to God, preach my Psalter, a prayer we know which combines vocal prayer and meditation, all centered in the great truths of the Incarnation, the truths which heretics almost always deny. And he did it, St. Dominic did. He preached the rosary publicly in the streets and in the hitherto abandoned churches, even as the friars continued the prayer of the divine office in the choir stalls of their priories. But preaching is never enough, nor teaching on its own. It must lead to and inform prayer. The medieval Dominicans were almost overwhelmed at their success. They didn't expect it. There were tens of thousands of people that flocked to them to go to confession and to return to church and to the sacraments. Our situation today is, of course, different. There are no Dominicans left to preach. The faith is gone. The Mass is no more. Moral anarchy looms in the land and awaits us. But we do have the beads. We have both psalters. We have prayer, both public and private, vocal, and the quiet prayer of head and of heart, warmed by meditation with the love of God. Let all the earth chant a psalm to thy name, O Lord. Now you know the power and the invitation of the beautiful words of the introit, which enable you every day to be instant in prayer, to do whatever he tells you. God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.